All right, this is the last hour of uh, Physics 1C for August 27th. Um, we are talking about electric fields now. So, electric fields. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll teach this to you in the way that it was taught to me. So, we start off with the following idea. Suppose uh, we have a charge, okay? a large charge particle here, so we're going to represent with a large plus sign. Um, it doesn't have to be plus, but for what we're going to do now, we're going to say that it is. This charge is going to carry a total charge that we're going to represent with a capital Q. Alright. And what we'd like to say is, suppose that I come to some point in space over here. Okay. Any point in space. But we choose this one. And we say, okay, well, there's a positive charge particle over here on the left. And it it has this effect on the space around it such that it's going to produce some kind of a field. And what's a field? Well, it's a mathematical thing, something called a vector field. But you don't need to understand that. All you need to understand is if I were to take another charge and place it right here, I don't want to use that color. If I was to take another charge and place it right here, and um, we're going to say that this is also going to be a positive charge, and we're going to label the charge that we place here, um, we're going to label it to be a Q, and we're going to say, by placing that charge there, okay, and this charge is going to have a name, we're going to call it the test charge, because it's going to act as kind of like a measuring tool to determine uh, the strength of what we're going to call the electric field. And what we know is that by putting a positive charge right there, you guys tell me, what's the direction of the electric force acting on this positive charge Q? Yeah, that's right. Now, we're going to say that this charge here, I forgot to mention, we're going to specifically say that this charge is fixed in place. It's not moving, okay? But the charge on the right would definitely feel a force from big Q that would point this direction here, right? If I was to draw a line uh, connecting the centers of these objects, like this, that line would continue through this charge and it would give me the direction of the electric force placed on this particle. And we call that F sub E, the electric force, right? And we also know what the value of the electric force is. The value of the electric force is, of course, uh, in this case, going to be equal to our, our constant K multiplied by the size of the charge Q, and then multiplied by the charge little Q, and then we would divide by uh, R squared, where R is going to be the distance between the two. Right. I haven't even used the word field yet, other than not yet. Just give me a second, Ash. All right. So we have a force at that location. That force is a vector, right? Um, in order to describe the vector nature of it. I don't know if it's super important, but what we would do is we'd say that the force is going to produce <clears throat> a, a, a vector force that's going to point um, in the same direction as what we would refer to as the r-hat vector, okay? A vector that points, a unit vector that points in the same direction as um, what we call the R vector, and I hate drawing more lines on here, but the R vector would basically point from here out to there. We call that the vector R. And R hat is a unit vector, a vector of length one that points in the same direction. And we can turn this into a vector by throwing R hat on there. So that's, that's a general way that we can describe what the electric force in this case is. All right. So, in order to define the electric field, what we want to do is we want to define a kind of force per unit charge. And how do you do force per charge? Well, you just divide by charge. And specifically, what we'll divide by in this case is we're going to divide by our, our test charge, Q. And what that's going to do is it's going to create what we're going to refer to as the electric field. And in the case of a point charge, that electric field has a very simple kind of construction. It's K 
times the charge Q of our source charge. We can now call this the source because it's going to be the source of our field. And E is going to represent the electric field. Okay, the electric field is represented by uh, the symbol E. If I divide this by Q, all I have left over is the R squared. And I also have that R hat vector sitting there as well. And this is our definition of what the electric field of a point charge is going to be. I'll provide some comparisons for you guys. It's K times Q divided by R squared. You can compare it to the force and notice that it's simply the force divided by Q. And in order to go backwards, if I already know what the electric field is, we have this very nice relationship that if I know what the electric field is produced by a point charge or a plane or whatever it happens to be produced by, if I want to find the force placed on my charge little q, I merely multiply by the electric field. And the really powerful thing about the two equations that are boxed in here is you can actually put the charge in with its sign. Okay? We'll come back to that later, but but in this equation, this charge Q, if it's positive, you put in positive Q. If it's negative, you put in negative Q. Same thing for the little Q, okay? But that right there defines our electric field, okay? Now, we can, we can kind of generalize this in the following sense and say, given a charge Q located at some point in space, any point in space around it is going to have an electric field. The size of the electric field is going to be dependent upon how far away you get from the charge. So let's say we fix this quantity Q to be 10 coulombs or some stupidly large number like that. Um, anywhere we go around it, we're going to produce an electric field. What does that look like? Let's say I come to a point right here. What's the direction of the electric field at this point gonna be? Well, it's found by drawing a vector from the center out to there. And then we say that's the direction of the R vector, right? And therefore, it's also the direction of the unit vector r hat, which is shorter. Okay, and then you just get a you get an electric field vector at this point that's going to point like that. Suppose that I come to a position that's exactly the same distance away, but above it, what direction is the electric field at this point going to be? Up. Over here, always away. You notice, right? For, for a positive point charge, the electric field is always going to point away no matter where we go. Now those, I tried to draw those lines of equal length. I don't know if I did a perfect job. But you can imagine a circle along which the electric field would have the exact same value at every one of these points. And this starts to draw out what we call a vector field. Because at every point in space, what we have is not just a size in terms of the number that associated with that point, but we also have a direction, right? That's what makes a vector field. At every point in space, you've got a size and a direction. I'm sure mathematicians would hear that and be like, I'm sure I'm glossing over all the details, right? But for this class, uh, the electric field, every point in space is going to have a size as well as a direction. The farther away you go, what do you think happens to the electric field the farther away you get? I think it gets weaker or stronger. It weakens, right? Because it's one over r squared, right? So maybe when I go out to this position right here, my electric field vector now looks a little smaller, okay? And then I come to this point right here, and now it looks a little smaller, and then I come over here, and it's smaller, and you get the idea. There's different ways to do this. And normally what we're going to do is we're basically just going to draw lines through all this stuff, actually. Um, there's different ways to visualize this stuff, but, but ultimately, that's what we mean when we say electric field. And I don't want to say anything else because just... Focus on the fact that the electric field is not a force. In order to feel a force, you need a charged particle to show up at one of these locations. Okay? If I place a negatively charged particle right here, it's going to be attracted, right? That's why I'm saying you can put the sign in, right? If I put a negative particle in here, it's going to feel a force opposite to the direction of the field. Yeah? So positively charged particles feel a force that points in the same direction as the field, right? I can come in here, I can take a positive charge, I can stick it right there and say, I know that this positive charge is going to feel a force. The force is going to point in the same direction as the electric field because look, 
the force vectors on the left, the electric field vectors on the right, they point in the same direction as long as this quantity Q is positive, right? So that's the force. And again, that force is Q times E, whatever the value is at that point. If this charged particle were to be moved right here, or another charged particle were to be placed right here, there would be a force placed on that particle, and it would point parallel to that electric field vector. That would be the direction of the force. If I come, let's say, to here, and I place a negatively charged particle, what direction is the force on this particle going to be? What's the direction of the electric force inwards, right? So the force points this way, but the field points that way. And it's purely because the sign of the charge just basically makes it so the force is opposite. So here's the general rule that you can understand is that positively charged particles will feel a force in the same direction as the electric fields. Negatively charged particles will feel a force that's in the opposite direction of the electric fields, right? Do you guys have any questions? This is far and away something that you are going to have to have a very fundamental understanding of. So if there's anything that I did you don't understand, please feel free to ask now before we start doing problems. We can visualize these things with um, uh, tools on the internet. So here's a positively charged thing that I can add in here, and it's going to draw me some field vectors. Notice that they all kind of point away. And they represent the, uh, the strength by showing that these things get kind of lighter and lighter and lighter as you move away. So the electric field is the strongest very close and it gets weaker as you get farther away. So the brightness here is what indicates that. A negatively charged particle, that produces electric field vectors that point inwards. Like this. The field of a negative charge is very similar to the gravitational field of a planet, right? What's a gravitational field? A gravitational field, and this is the connection I think that's important to understand so you can get an idea of what it is. Because we all live in a gravitational field, right? We all live in a gravitational field that points down towards the planet and causes us to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared, right? So the gravitational field of a planet, you've got an object M, you would have a gravitational field that would point inwards. And what's the symbol for the gra Do anyone know what the symbol for the gravitational field is going to be? What symbol do you think we use for gravitational field? You've all seen it before in Physics 1A. Not Fg. That's the force of gravity, right? What do we use for the gravitational field? We use G. It's little g, though. That G that you learn about, oh god, that's a Q. That G that you learn about in, uh, you know, force equal to M times G, like weight is mass times gravity, that G is the gravitational field of the planet. Okay? And, oh, I keep drawing cues. Um, that's, that's gravitational field, okay? And when you get close to the planet, right? So if there's if you're on the surface of the planet, what do those what do those lines start to look like when you get close to the planet? What's the direction of the gravitational field near the near the surface of the planet? It's inwards, and those lines then suddenly become straight parallel lines, right? Perpendicular to the surface, exactly. Parallel lines. This would be the gravitational field of the planet. All the lines would point down. And we can even say explicitly that if we define up to be positive y, the gravitational field of the planet, what, what's it equal to? You guys actually know what it's equal to, right? It's going to be related to j hat. It's going to be negative. And what's the value that I put right here? You guys all know what it is. We call it g. It's 9.8, right? Normally, we write it as meters per second squared, but something that 
people often do to compare these two things is we write it as newtons per kilogram. Newtons per kilogram. That's, that's, that's a good way to think of what the gravitational force is, is it's defined in terms of newtons per kilogram. If you look at the units, these are exactly equivalent to meters per second squared, but it's like newtons per kilogram, right? Because then if I wanna find the force placed on a massive object, right, I put an M in here, how do I find the force? It's easy, gravitational force, you've all seen this before, it's M times G, right? I compare this to the thing I just described to you. For a, um, th there's actually a way to produce exactly the same thing with electricity. We're gonna learn about this in a couple chapters here, but if I take a, uh, a positively charged metallic plate Okay, and I place it really close to a negatively charged metallic plate. Talk about how we do this later on, but it turns out you just connect both of these up to a battery, as it turns out. Stick a battery in here. It's pretty simple. You guys have batteries. You could make one of these yourselves if you wanted to with uh, some pieces of foil. So positive side of the battery here, negative side of the battery here. There is a chat. Yeah, that's, that's right. There's an example with this in the book that we'll go through. This is actually going to produce electric field lines that look exactly like gravitational field lines, as it turns out. Just the same. That's going to be our electric field now. And let's say we've got a value for this. And maybe we just use a really simple value. We say the electric field in this case is going to be negative 10. And I didn't tell you what the units of the, the electric field were yet. But you can probably guess, based on what we said before, that they have to be units of newtons per coulomb. And now you can see the connection between these two. We can define a gravitational field as negative 9.8 newtons per kilogram. We can define an electric field as negative 10 newtons per coulomb. And, you know, when we think about what happens to these objects, right, this object feels a gravitational force that points down. And if I was to place a positively charged particle in here, it would feel an electric force that points down, like this. You put a negatively charged particle in here, it feels an electric force that goes up this way. And the green lines are the electric field lines in this case, and they're gravitational field lines in this case. But that, that's what the electric field is. It's no different than the gravitational field. It's like a... It's like a region in space, right? Where if I, if I think about gravi what is the gravitational field? If I put any massive object off of the planet, it's gonna accelerate towards the planet, right? And it's gonna accelerate with a force vector that points in the direction of those gravitational field lines. Does that mean that massively charged objects always travel along these lines? Is that true? Do massively charged objects always travel along lines like this? No, they don't. Because if I was to give this particle a velocity, Right? If I give it a velocity off in this direction, that charged particle is going to have a path that's going to look parabolic right? as it goes down towards the planet. So these lines, they're not trajectories. They're quite simply lines of force. That's the word that uh, Faraday used for them. He called them lines of force. They're not forces. They're lines of force. They're the, they're the lines along which the forces are always going to act. Okay, And I, I like that and I'm almost better than electric field. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's what we use these days is electric field. It, it is more applicable but in terms of like the way that, that Faraday was learning it. So, so that's what a field is. It's, it's quite simply a place in space where there's not really anything there, right? There's not an object at this location or this location or this location. There's simply this effect of the positive particle that if there were to be a charged particle to be placed there, that charged particle would feel it, right? Why is there a field even though there's not a particle? Well, can I ask the question, do you think gravity exists if there's not anything to feel it? Does the gravitational acceleration exist even if something's not feeling it? You see what I mean? It's the exact same thing. It's just that we we personally feel the gravitational field, right? We feel the gravitational field. It's always acting on us. It's always accelerating us towards the ground and holding us here to the ground, right? We don't feel the electric field because we don't have charged particles. Although we actually can kind of feel the electric field. Um, let me give you an example. This is something that I really wish I could, uh, um, hold on a second. You guys have heard of a Van de Graaff machine before? On the opening picture of this book, the Van de Graaff machine, it's these things. Or when you touch it, your hair stands up basically, okay? When you get your hands near something like this, you can literally feel the hairs on your arms start to stand up, you know? You can actually feel the hairs on your arms start to stand up. So in a way, you can kind of, in a way, kind of feel the electric field because 
your your arm your your hairs they're really thin and light and if they gain any excess charge you'll start to feel the electric field in the same way that you feel the gravitational field when you jump off the planet right so so again the electric field is something that that alters the region of space such that if there were a charged particle there the charged particle would feel a force okay it's a very real thing it's just as real as the gravitational field it's just as real as electric forces and it has some amazing properties such that waves can propagate along these things light waves propagate along these things so um it, it's it's almost if you think about the way we set it up right it's like you got a charge you go to a point in space you say there's an electric field there and you ask so what did ash say it's a really good question why is there a field even if there's not a particle well you need you do need the source particle number one but in order to have a field you don't need two objects you only need one object that's the key thing is you only need one object for the field you need two objects for a force right you always need two objects for a force. Would you guys agree with that statement? That you can't have a force with just one object? If our universe was simply one particle, it would never feel forces, right? Does that make sense? So for a field, you only need one object. For a force, you need two objects. That's one of the key differences. Okay, do you guys have any questions? Hopefully I've explained this in a way. Even if that particle is not charged, it has a field. That's a great question. If it was a neutral particle, no. It would not have an electric field. That's right. If it's a neutral particle, the field would be equal to zero. Ash is saying it's like gravity where... Yeah. It exerts on everything in the universe. It, it, I don't know if I'd say it exerts, but it, it modifies the properties of space all around it. So in that sense, it, it, it affects everything in the universe, you might say, um, by, by, you know, creating this field. All right. So we have this definition of what an electric field is. It extends infinitely, um, as far as we know. Uh, and what we described is the field of a point charge. But as soon as you make it a little bit more complex, Okay, this is a point charge. By adding in another charge in here, things change quite a bit. So you go from these nice, simple, straight lines pointing inwards like a sink, right? I think of this as like a sink. And I think of this like a sprinkler that's spraying out these lines everywhere. The moment that you put two of them together, everything gets way more complicated. Now you've got curves. If I was to draw a line through these things, it would create curvy lines. And as you as you move around with one of these little sensors that represents the force, you can see some properties of this. But uh, it's much more complicated the moment you have two objects, and you can imagine that if you add even more, it gets even weirder. All right. Those look like magnetic fields. Yeah, I specifically chose the two that I put up here originally these when i have we call this a dipole yeah they definitely look like magnetic field lines absolutely you take a magnet that has let's say a north pole and a south pole and you cover it with iron filings you see these features basically much easier to see it with magnetism there's other ways to visualize these things that i'm going to leave this is something that you guys can do on your own i've updated your course website now it has all kinds of new content on here um but I'm going to draw your eyes to this one as something you might want to look at before next time. We're going to be talking about electric field lines. Um, this is a simulator for those in two dimensions. And um, it's kind of neat. Um, what we can do is you can see kind of the type of um, lines that get produced. Now, this line here, what they've done, these aren't field, these are electric field lines. They're a li little different from electric field vectors. Um, the field vectors are these arrows. The lines are what's created when you kind of sketch a path that's tangent to all these at every point. Um, and you can get some really interesting type of designs from this. So we're going to talk in more detail about electric field lines next time and some of their properties because it's going to be pretty helpful for us for uh, the next chapter that we're going to talk about. So You can find links to this on the website, on Canvas.
as well as some other things with electric fields. There's electric field hockey, which is a, a game you can play with electric fields. Um, but uh, yeah, don't get overwhelmed. I just dumped the entire course from my other courses on here. Okay. All right, so um, what's left? We, I think we have a little bit of time. Oh, plenty of time, actually. Um, we're going to do some electric field problems. Okay, hopefully you guys have gained some understanding of what the electric field is. If you ever forget what it is, just remember that it is a... Uh... Where's the first one? Here's the first one we want to do, I believe. Right? Yeah, this is it. I already moved this one, so I can delete it. really takes up the whole screen. Okay, this is a problem from your textbook. All right. Uh, it's the field of an electric dipole. Dipole just means... Yes, it, the electric field is definitely a vector field, as is the gravitational field. Yep, definitely a vector field. That's right, Fosso. Okay, so this is the problem. Um, I think... Uh, I feel like... I should probably be able to just do this one, I think. I don't, I, don't, I mean, I can I can set up some stuff for you, but. Um, so, we talked about the electric field for a single object, okay? And that's all you're really gonna need to do this problem, combined with the idea of superposition. So, the electric field, oh, nope, not that one. The electric field, as I said, was defined by K, multiplied by the size of your charge, divided by the distance to the point, and then you multiply by r hat. You don't really need to worry about this r hat. It's, it's telling you direction, but most of the time you're just gonna use your brain. But in general, the idea is I've got a charge, that charge is Q, I come out to some point that's a distance r away, and I say at this location, there's an electric field vector, and it's given by that expression right there. Okay, that's, that's all you really need to know to solve this problem here. Um, you have two charges. They're equal and opposite signs. That's what makes them a dipole. A dipole is a particular type of thing that we're going to be dealing with quite a bit. Charge 1 is 12 nanocoulombs, and charge 2 is negative 12 nanocoulombs. They're separated by 0.1 meters. And there's some places on here. And we're going to try to find the electric field at each of these locations. Okay. I think I might do the first one. And... Um, do dipoles have to be equal and opposite? Yep, that's right, equal and opposite, separated by some distance. I think I might do the first one here to give you an idea of like how you want to do the rest of them. Okay, I'm going to come to this point A right here in space, and I'm going to ask, what is the electric field at this location? Okay, what's the total electric field due to these two charges? Okay, so first of all, if I wanted to draw a vector at point A, to represent the electric field created by the pink Q1, what direction would it point? To the right. Do you guys understand that? Does that, sound, does that sound right to you guys? So I would draw a vector here. It's gonna point to the right and it never snaps where you want it to snap, so you have to like, oh no, not that. Does control Z really not do undo? There we go. Um, Oh no. Stop. How do I? Really? Okay, we're just gonna. I am using the mouse, dude. This is the mouse. Oh my god. Is, is this part of the problem? Let's try that again. Control Z. Why is Control Z not working? Let's just try it again. Oh, this is the annotation on the diagram stuff again, I bet. You know, I'm not even gonna. We're not even going to try it. We're just going to draw an arrow. Okay, that arrow is going to represent the electric field created by the pink object right here. And I'm going to call that E1. It's a vector. What is the direction of the electric field created by the negative charge at point A? Someone else want to ask? ask? It's also to the right. Because electric fields point towards... Electric fields point towards Q2. Yep. So I'll put in blue the direction of that field. Now, which one's going to be bigger? Is it going to be the, the pink vector or the blue vector that I'm drawing? It's 
blue, right? Because we're closer. This one's six centimeters away, the other one's four centimeters away. So there's these two. And now to find the net field, right? The total field. I just have to, to add E1 plus E2. Right? E1 is going to be K times Q1 divided by R squared. And now I'm just going to do magnitude now because we can see they both point in the same direction. We don't need to worry about the vector part. KQ1 over R squared. Um, well, instead of using R, actually, let's just put the numbers in. So Q1 is a distance of uh, 6 centimeters away from point A, right? I should say this is EA that we're doing here. So here I would put 6 centimeters, but i got to convert that, right? So 0 0.06 meters. And then I'm going to add to that E2 which is 4 centimeters away, so that's going to be k times q2 divided by uh, 0.04. Now I'm not going to put the negative sign in for this now because I've already magnituded it. So I'm just going to get k... k they're the same charge actually too, so it's going to end up being 12 nanocoulombs, which is 12 times 10 to the negative 19. No, negative 9, sorry. Keeping in mind up here that k is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9. Can you guys calculate what that is for me? What's Ea going to be? That looks right to me, so 12 divided by 0.06. Nine seven five zero zero. That's what I got to. So this ends up being uh, nine seven five zero zero newtons over coulombs. And we can put an i hat on there to make it a full vector, right? That's it. So you'll see some problems like this on your homework for sure. But what I want you guys to do, probably for the rest of the class, I don't see a way we do another thing other than this. Maybe we can do one more problem, but at least set it up. Find the electric field at B, and find the electric field at point C. Up here. Okay, someone's already figured it out. All right, so. Yeah, the rest of you guys, go ahead and go ahead and try to solve this problem. And uh, I think Ty Bui in the future, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but might want to wait like a minute or two before solving it and putting the answer in if you could. Does that make sense? All right, so you guys go ahead and give it a shot. If you do have questions, let me know. And we'll come back and talk about the answer here in five minutes or so. Yeah, again, I specifically just asked you not to do that. Please don't answer so quickly. It's, an, it's, it's good that you can do it. I'm not trying to like stifle you, but you gotta give other people a shot at trying to get the answer before you answer it. But I don't know if those answers are right or not, so we'll just, we'll wait to see what other people get. Sure. Uh, the question is, why are E1 and E2 pointing the same way? Uh, the reason is because electric fields for positive charges always point um, away from them, okay? 
So I got a positively charged particle here. And I go to the right of it, electric field's going to point that way. If I have a negatively charged particle, if I'm on this side of it, the electric field goes this way. If I'm on this side of it, the electric field goes this way. If I'm below it, the electric field goes this way. This way. Again, it acts like a sink. All the electric field vectors go inwards toward the negative charge. So coming to this picture here, positive charge on the left always has electric field lines that go away from it. So if I go to the right this way, electric field points to the right. From this point at point A, the negative charge is to my right, so my electric field line for that has to go towards it. So that's the rule. Does that make sense, Anna? You guys have been thinking for a bit. I'm going to interrupt your thinking for just a second. So I just want to make sure everyone's on the same boat here. Let's look at point B. Um, what direction is the electric field for the pink one going to point at point B? Is it left or right? Positive charge. It's got to go away from the positive charge. So there's the charge. We go away right here. What about for the negative charge? What direction do I draw for the negative charge? Right, because negative charge is going to have an electric field vector that points towards it. And then I know this one's smaller, right? Because we're farther away. And this one's bigger. So, there you go. Alright, before we move on to C, did anyone get an answer for Part B yet? Or do you need a little more time? I mean, Ataya obviously got an answer. Did you guys agree with his answer? More time. We'll give you guys more time before we talk about it. Remember to be very careful about when you put the negative sign in. That is something that can definitely be confusing. Said, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm just so excited about the electric field. The people watching the field.
if you got the same thing as he got... No, he said it was negative, didn't he? Yeah. To the left, yeah. That means to the left, yeah, exactly. All right, so you guys are kind of concurring that for EB, you end up getting... Um, let me scroll up a little bit here. 62K, basically. This one ends up being negative uh, 62,000 um, I hat. Okay. What about EC? Did you guys, uh, let's, let's just talk about it really quickly about to get the direction of the vectors, right? Um, so, positive charge here, right? We go all the way up to this point right here. And what direction do I want to point for the positive charge here? For the vet, for the field right here, you just keep going in the same direction, right? Straight up along that same direction, and then E two, it's negative, right? So it's going to point back towards it. Now these two vectors are not in the same uh, direction. How do you determine the angles? Great question. How do you determine? Inverse, trig, yeah. Can I draw another line on this picture that'll make it easier to see how to find it? Maybe bisect the bottom side? We create a triangle where this side is five now, right? What's the other side gonna be? Do you need to use uh, the Pythagorean theorem to figure it out, or do you guys know? 5, 13, what's this one? 5, 13, what is it? This is a special triangle, right? Twelve. It's cosine, well, 13 cosine alpha would give you 5, 13 sine alpha would give you 12, arc tan of 12 over 5 would give you alpha, right? And, you can, and alpha's going to be the same up here, too, if you want. What do you guys get for the angle? And then with EC, there's something special that happens with these two vectors, right? What's, spe what's special about these two vectors here? They're not perpendicular to each other, but they are the vertical components cancel. Exactly, right? So there's going to be a, a component here that's going to point this way for this one. And there's going to be an equal and opposite component for the other one that points the other way. So when we add those two vectors together, you can ignore the J, exactly, that's right. You only need to worry about the X component, right? And the vectors have the same length, too, right? So I would argue that EC is going to be something like uh, E1, you know, cosine of alpha plus E2 cosine of alpha. But E1 and E2 are actually equal to each other, right? So it's equal to double E1 cos alpha. There you go, and you you can you got to figure out what the e one is, right? You got to do the calculation from here. And make sure your calculators are in degrees. The vast majority of this course, your calculators are going to be in degrees until the very very end, I believe. You can do it in radians. Nothing wrong with doing it in radians.
we got like two minutes left, so I think what we'll do is go ahead and finish this one out. Your E1 in this case is going to be K times this charge, which was 12 nanocoulombs. And now, we, which what, what, what do I divide by in this case to find the electric field at C for E1? What goes in the denominator down here? Do I use 5? Do I use 12? Do I use 5 plus 12? Do I use 13? Yeah. Yeah, point one three squared, that's right. I'm pretty sure you're going to get the answer that uh, um, Ty had put up here a while ago. 49.16, that sounds right to me. Depending on where you round off, I assume. And the unit is newtons over coulombs. And this one is also I hat. You guys agree with that? You get the same thing? Well, I didn't even put the unit right here. That's my bad. Forty-nine twelve. Yeah. So let's just say it's forty-nine zero zero then, because there's going to be rounding errors for sure, definitely. But to to at least two sig figs, I would assume you're all getting about the same answer. So we'll call forty-nine. Well, do you guys have any questions? Go ahead. What's up? Yeah. Oh, why did I use 13? Okay. It's because the, the, the electric field definition, uh, what shows up here is R. R is the distance between the charge, okay, and the point. Just the, the shortest distance, which in this case would be 13. All right. Does that answer the question? No problem. Well, so it... Do you want me to explain again why it's 13? Ash or something else? So I guess we didn't get to the hard part today. <laughs> Although the stuff we did probably seemed pretty hard. There's harder stuff to come. In particular, this problem right here. I would say in order for next time, why don't we use the Y components in part C? Sure, we'll talk about that right now. Um, this is a problem from your textbook. It is definitely one of the hardest things we're going to do. I would highly recommend if you want to understand what we do on Monday, you might want to review this uh, this problem right here, 21.10. It's an example problem in university physics. It involves finding the field of a charge line segment. And I will definitely explain it to you. You're going to have some homework problems on it. There's a ton of calculus. Yep. It's, it's fun. It's legitimately fun. Okay. Uh, the reason why we didn't use the Y components in this case is because one point's north and one point's south, or one point's in positive Y and one point's in negative Y. And they both have exactly the same sign. Yeah, that's right, Tyler. Ignore the charge of the particle. Now, keep in mind, by the way, we didn't ignore the charge of the particle. We simply, we, we kind of baked it into this part here, right? That we already took into account the sign of the particle when we did the directions. So if we also came in here and put a negative sign, we would have been double counting it. Does that make sense, Tyler? Like, if I drop a negative sign in here... I've already said, well, they point the same direction, right? That's that's the reason. Okay, yeah, got it. That being said, you can... There's definitely a way to do it where you, you make it negative. It's just a little more complicated in certain situations. And this one, that was... Um, yeah, so like Ash said, that, that problem is really confusing. And it, it does involve a lot of calculus, but it's going to be representative of... A lot of the problems you're going to see show up, uh, especially on the the lab manual and and your and your homework too, actually. Um, yeah. So, does anyone else have any further questions? Otherwise, I'm going to stop the stream and then answer what other just kind of general questions you have off stream.
I, so I, I do see your question, Ash, about how these dipole moments compare to chemistry ones. I didn't... Uh, 21.1. Uh, 21.10. Yes, 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 yes. That's the problem. Um, it is... Uh, let me... This is it right here. 21, this is the problem you're definitely going to look at. The other ones are, are really quite easy by comparison. This one is very challenging. If you want to get an idea of in general what we're doing, you might want to read 21.9 as well. But I think this is the one that's the most challenging um, from a conceptual perspective. Uh, it's, it starts here, and then it continues onto this page here. Here's the drawing. The drawing looks awful because of all these weird artifacts and stuff. But hopefully I'll be able to draw a better version of it. It reminds you of calculating moments of inertia. It's exactly like calculating moments of, moments of inertia, actually. It's, it's almost exactly the same thing. Yep. And Bella says it to me. Yep. The uh, <laughs> moments of inertia calculation. That's the best part, though. What are you talking about? Uh, this is even more challenging, I think, because moment of inertia is, is a scalar, right? And electric fields are vectors. So <laughs> you get that extra number you got to calculate, and that makes it that much harder. <laughs> and you got to do trig... And then you've got to do integrals that have trig in them. I will say that the integral we'll do is going to be way simpler than the one that we, they do here. They, they make it a lot harder than it needs to be, in my opinion. But, you know, it's university physics. It's, it's what they do. Okay, uh, stopping the recording for now. And I'll, I'll keep answering uh, 